Okay, guys. So I've got Catherine here, one of my most favorite people in the whole world, definitely up there on, on the top five on the fingers. And I'm really excited to, to have her speak to you guys today because I know it's going to bring so much power. I have a feeling this is going to be a podcast that I like refer a bunch of people like, go listen to my Catherine Dixon episode. <laughs> so um, Catherine, I'm excited to dig in with you. And I thought it would be cool if you could give them a little bit of background because I know a lot of people are familiar with the work of Byron Katie. Maybe they're not. This might be their intro, but um, I thought it'd be cool if you you can maybe share how you got into this, like what, almost 20 years ago? 22 years ago. <laughs> 22. Okay. Yeah. Tell us how, how did this happen? Well, well, I'll tell you, I mean, a little bit, even before that, I've always known that I should be happier than I was <laughs> throughout my whole life. I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. And I did all kinds of things to try and find that happiness that I somehow knew lived inside of me and nothing really stuck. I mean, I even spent 13 years in a spiritual community, which was great. I mean, I had these outrageously cool meditations and realizations, it seemed, but once I opened my eyes and got off my pillow, I like to say all bets were off, right? Mm. You know, because I was back to my standard context of reality and mm. nothing had changed there. And so I just kept looking, 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 and chasing down teachers and whatever. And then, um, you know, kind of got into the Course in Miracles, not kind of, I was into the Course in Miracles, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, I don't do it now because I've found that the work is actually the practical application of mm. inquiry, self, in, you know, of the Course in Miracles. So anyway, mm. so this friend of mine encouraged me to come to this event. Katie was coming to town and I'd actually seen a little flyer and I thought, yeah, been there, done that. The last thing I need is another flipping guru, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. have 95 t-shirts. And so um, <laughs> I just, I just didn't know, but my friend was so insistent that I stick around for this event that I did. And I'm so glad I did because Byron Katie walked in, this was in spring of 1997 and I was expecting nothing because I'd been so disappointed. And she just asked this young man, this beautiful young man who was suffering a lot. Um, he loved his family. It turned out this was in 1997. He was this beautiful young gay man, you know, 17 or something. And he loved his family immensely and in the you know mormon church that's not workable and mm -hmm. so his heart was broken because he knew who he was but he adored his family and he just was in hell and so she walked him through the four questions which is the self-inquiry of the work of byron katie she just asked him these four questions and he went from literal literally tara agony into ecstasy I mean, you could just, he just lit up because he tapped into his truer nature, which is what these questions do. And part of the reason I love the work so much, I like to share the two things that matter the most to me about the work is that the answers that we're looking for are inside of us. I do not have anyone, ans anyone else's answers, but I know without a doubt that they have them, right? Mm -hmm. And so these questions help us to find it. And it's something that you can give yourself. I mean, working with me is great and fun and I love working with people. It makes my heart sing. And this is something you can do independently. And working with a coach for a little while can be helpful, but this is self-inquiry. This is about you finding the truth of you. And so when I saw Katie do that, I was like, wow, this is it for me. And it was. Yeah. Yeah. I, so we'll get into that a little bit on the, like the four questions, if you're, if you're okay with that. But I think for me, what I found, what I have found to be so powerful about the work that I do with you is that I have found that when it gets hard, my brain likes to stop. Right. Mm -hmm. And once I get to this, the normal barrier of where my brain has normally been of like, well, this is true because yeah, like that guy's a jerk and he did that to me. And like, that is just unacceptable. And that's the end of the story, you know? And like, that's, yeah. that's as far as my brain wants to go. And then it's having you sit there and say, well, what does that mean about you? What does that mean about him? Like what, you know, what stories are being created here? What do you, what, what thoughts are, you know, what adjectives would you use? What feelings? And it's like, Oh, I don't want to talk about all that. It's like, this is so hard. 
hard to think of all the, <laughs> you know, and so yeah. sometimes it's like having someone there to pull out the stories and get us to dig a little deeper. That's what we don't do. We don't get past yeah. hard. We're just like, like we're just caught in our current belief system and that's it. It's really hard. It's like, we might get a tinge of a little bit of like, oh, wow. I, maybe I'm like that because I was always like that with my mom. Oh, oh okay. Done. <laughs> End of story. So, um, I'd love to dig into, could you share some about the four questions and a little bit more of like how that helps us rewrite our stories? I will. And, and I want to just comment on what you just said to it, Tara too, because I mean, what I bring to the space is absolute faith that people can find themselves mm -hmm. because I've been able to find myself with these, this process over and over again, especially when I thought I couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so that's helpful. And when you first start inquiry, you don't know how good life can be. You don't even no. have a context for the freedom and the creativity and the power that lives inside of you because yeah. we've been sort of distracted from that by our culture and our training and our this, that, and the others. And, you know, so it's understandable that it's a little bit challenging for people to do it independently. Occasionally, right. I mean, I've run into two people in 22 years that are like, I've been doing the work myself and it's been working great, <laughs> you know, but we don't have the discipline to really, yeah. because we don't know what's possible. It's like, you know, so there's right. that. So the four questions, what are the four questions? Essentially, let me just back up and say that we don't see reality. We see our beliefs about reality. And those are not the same, fortunately. We see what we believe. We don't see what's true. And what we believe is very, very limited. And what's true is very, very not. Does that make sense? Definitely. And so, um, you know, yeah. Byron Katie says, has a one-liner that I love, which is reality is always kinder than our beliefs about it. Wow. And that's a mind blower. If you really, I mean, if, if everything you think you know is a shadow of what's true, that's a mind blower, right? Really? You know, and there have been times I like to say, especially in the beginning, when I sat down to do the work and I'm like, damn it, Katie, there is no way reality is kind. I know life stinks. And um, then I do the inquiry and I discover that it was my thinking about life that stinks, not <laughs> life. Right. And that is hugely cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's what the work does is it asks you questions. So you look at an area of your life where you feel tied up or afraid or angry or whatever it is, any emotion that you're not happy about. And you look at the moment in time where you were feeling that thought. And then you write out your answers to, I am frustrated with so-and-so. And so-and-so could be a person or a you know, situation in your life. It can be your finances, your health, you know. I love the name of this podcast, Inside Out Health, because <laughs> that's what this is about too. Um, and so you focus on an issue. And wherever we have issues, we have constraining beliefs. Does that make sense? Yep. And we don't even know that they're constraining. They, they're, everybody else thinks the same thing, so why wouldn't I think that too? Right. So you look at those moments, and then you question the reality, the validity of the thought that is causing you stress and you answer honestly there's no right answer this work is self-realization we've been other realized for all our lives that's why chasing down spiritual teachers or even you know meditating didn't do it because i was i wasn't looking into me yeah you know right right so yeah so the questions essentially are you look at a situation um whatever it might be. Do you want to do an example or should we, I'll just tell you what the four questions are and we can go from okay. there. Um, the, first, the first question is, you think of a stressful thought, so-and-so was unkind to me, maybe as an example. Mm -hmm. They should have been kinder. Mm -hmm. The first question is, is it true? Is it true that that person should be kinder, should have been kinder in that moment? They are however they are. And the second question is a little bit annoying, I like to say, because it's, can you absolutely know that it's true, that whatever the story is, so that person should have been kinder. 
can I ask them? Well, yes, I absolutely do know. Or sometimes people are like, well, I don't really know what's going on in their lives, you know? Yeah. So then the third question is, how do you react when you believe that stressful thought? Now that will bring you all kinds of interesting perceptions mm -hmm. of how we show up in the world. Because when we're believing a stressful thought, we're not operating on all cylinders, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. We can't see clearly. We don't even hear what's going on. We go into stress mode and we just are not available for anything other than our fearful, angry, whatever stories. Does that make sense? Yep. So it's helpful to really look at the effect of believing the stressful thought, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't see the impact of the stressful thought, there will be no motive to change. Right. Yep. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, so we take a good look at the effect of believing that thought. How do you see the other person? How do you treat them? These are sub questions of question three. How do you see yourself? How do you treat you? How does the future look when you believe this thought? And, and it's really interesting because there's a million stories and you'll be like, wow, I didn't know there was all this wrapped up in that. Totally. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and then, and then once we kind of, um, purge the confusion, because who you are in the stressful thought is actually, in my story, it's not, who, it's not your true nature. It's you distracted in confusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we believe a stressful thought, we just are not ourselves. We are possessed by confusion, essentially. Yep. Yeah. So then comes question four, my favorite, which is who would you be? Who would you have been in that moment when you thought they should be kinder? In that very moment, because you want to focus, otherwise your mind will just go trailing off into nine directions. But right. when you focus in that moment, who would you have been without the thought that they should be kinder? And at first your brain will be like, huh? And kind of tilt <laughs> out a bit. But then right. when you sit with it, you discover all kinds of possibilities and that never even occurred to you totally. that are much more in alignment with who you know yourself to be. Totally. Right? And one of the things that has amazed me in that process, and of course this goes on for about two hours, so we're really digging into the facets of each of those questions. But what amazes me is every time I've done it with you, and I've done it, guys, it's what, been about two, a little over two years now. Every time when I'm in the beginning phases of those first questions, it's, my voice is completely different. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, like, so, what am I saying about myself? Oh, that like, I'm a mess and I'm out of control. And I, um, you know, like, oh, I can't believe I did that. I was so stupid. Like that, that, that's my tone. And then when we get to the flip side of it, it's like, there's me again. I'm just like, free, happy, kind, loving. Like, it's like all of this, like diminished small voice goes away. And now I'm like, I feel, I literally sound like myself again, once I get back into reality, the yes. reality of the situation. Yes. yes. I, I think one of the things that's so fascinating <laughs> is like, sometimes I'll have to just like be quiet and close my eyes and just like, I feel like I'm like letting the re the recircuiting of my brain happen in the middle of a session. I'm like, hold on. Like I am seeing this differently now. Like just give me a second to let it settle. And you know, why do you, th and we, we've talked about yawning, you know, sometimes it's like yawning, taking in more oxygen. Like why do you think it is that we're able to, you know, w just within that two hour session, be able to do so much rewiring of our thinking around a certain topic? Well, you're not even really, I mean, you know, yeah. It feels like I am. I mean, I could be are, wrong. You are. And <laughs> it, yeah, there's, there's neuroscience around creating new neural pathways and all that. And that's mm -hmm. actually what makes you yawn because when I get to, it's, it's almost like clockwork. Who would you be without the thought? Within three to five minutes, most people start yawning because you're actually, your brain needs more oxygen to function. You know, yeah. why, why is it, ask the question again, why is it so? Why, why, uh, why is it that normally, let's say it's like, okay, that person wronged me, that person fouled me, like, you know what, right. screw them. Like, I can't stand them. that. They're just a bad person. Like, I'm just going to cut them out of my life and like, 
Yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, so that's kind of where we get. And then I come in to, you know, do a session with you and it's like, wow, I, I walk out like with compassion and freedom and let them be who they are. And I am who I am. And, you know, why is it, do you think that we don't get there on our own? You know, we read all these books. We, maybe you've read <laughs> Loving What Is by Byron Katie. Maybe you constantly listen to podcasts on mindset or read tons of books. But like when it comes to the practicality, like, why do you think we have such a hard time getting there on our own? Because we're used to our habitual thought patterns and this work takes you out of them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when you really go in and who would I be and you discover your true self, you're actually accessing, like we said, your true nature, which is always inside of you. Lots yeah. of times people will have sessions and they'll, you know, they'll look at me kind of nervous, like, how do I hold on to this, Catherine? And I'm like, you don't have to. It's who you really are. Just stop believing the stressful thoughts when they come up. So it is qualitatively different because you have an actual experience of who you really are. And you know, you can feel you deep inside, even in your darkest moments, you know, somebody's there that you're not connected with, you know, mm -hmm. your truer nature that has not been confused in the systems that we've subjected ourselves to into the you know societal expectations and all of that kind of thing and so we're peeling away the nonsense so that your true nature can illumine you yeah yeah could we do can we do an example of just yeah. the basic four questions maybe for health right since this is a health podcast okay. yeah. um so i mean i guess i'll do yeah we'll, Let's possibly do, um, maybe my stressful thought is I'm, I'm never going to lose weight. Would, would that one work? That seems to be a common that feeling work. people experience. Okay. Another, yes. Never going to lose weight. It's never going to work. Okay. It's never. So what is your one liner explicitly? It would be good if it's something that you can relate to rather than just kind All of right. being an example. Um, Let's see. All right, we're gonna do a live sesh. Live sesh, Tara. Yeah, we're gonna do a live <laughs> mini sesh. Yeah. Mm, at the body. How about this one? This is one I've been working on lately. Is um, a little bit of beating myself up about not being disciplined in my nighttime routine and getting to bed on time. Right. So I've been kind of like, oh, come on, Tara. Like, let's go. So maybe the stressful thought is like, I'm. I um. I have no discipline at night <laughs> or something like that. I'm getting to bed. I'm not disciplined at bedtime or something like that. So I'm I, not disciplined enough or I should be more I disciplined? I should be more disciplined at, uh, with my evening routine. I should be more disciplined in my evening routine. Yeah. Let's do that one. I can relate. All right, guys, here we go. <laughs> and I invite everyone who's listening to this to go ahead and find your own version. I should be more disciplined. It might not be your evening routine, but unwind unravel your own confusion here yeah because, yeah it's a lot more powerful than just watching tara so you should be and think of a moment where that was really true maybe last night mm -hmm. yep yeah i think oh, so i'll go the moment that i'll go to is earlier this week i accidentally slept in until 8 30 and it like super frustrated me because i that's usually like my power creation time from like 5 to 8 30. i'm like that's three and a half hours of like creating the life of my dreams that i missed out on because i stayed up too late <laughs> so okay. yeah that's the moment all right. all right so you should be more disciplined in your evening routine tara is it true feels true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you absolutely know that it's true that you should be more disciplined in your evening routine? I guess not necessarily. <laughs> Where'd you find you're not necessarily? I'm like, well, maybe you sh don't have to be so disciplined all the time. Right. So that thought popped in. Okay. All right. All right. So just let yourself have that because we operate as though everything we think we know it's true, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And we hang out with people that agree with us, so that makes us even more sure, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you react? How did you react when you woke up late that morning this week, last week, this week, when yeah. you believe the thought, you should be more disciplined in your evening routine, and here it is, eight freaking 30. 
Um, I was, I shamed myself. I was disappointed in myself. Um, I was frustrated. Uh, I felt frazzled. Like now I've got to rewrite my whole day. So I felt, um, just like rushed. Um, I felt like a little bit of a disappointment as a coach, right? Because like I, I'm having my clients do this. So it's like, Oh, you didn't do it today. And you're expecting them to do it every day. All right. So there was some, um, shaming, beating myself up on that. Uh, also like trying to do this cognitive, like, that's okay. Like the, the over positiving it, but deep inside, I was like, dang it, dude, I gotta get to bed earlier. So this doesn't keep happening. You know, um, what else? So where do you feel this in your body? Mm. Because our thoughts affect every part of us. <laughs> they don't just affect, you know, us, they affect how we show up in the world, how we live in our bodies. How do you feel in your body? How did you feel that morning waking up at 8.30 when it seemed really true? You should be more disciplined in your evening routine. Um, I'd say I felt at, at first I felt a wave of weakness, like just feeling weak in my body. Like, Oh, like I freaking like it's this surrender weakness feeling, but then it instantly turned into like adrenaline, like go, let's go, let's <laughs> maximize what we can. So I felt like this, um, very rushed adrenaline driven feeling of feeling almost like frantic to salvage as much as I could of the morning. Okay. And where do you feel that in your body? my limbs, I guess I'd say my limbs, like my arms and lightly just like go, go, go. Um, also let's see. Mm. You should be more disciplined in your evening routine. Yeah. The initial wave of weakness in the body is interesting. Like that I can feel like in my face and neck and chest, like almost like embarrassment or shame, like, ah, oh, like that that almost burning feeling of embarrassment really with myself. Okay. So thank you. Mm -hmm. You should be more disciplined in your evening routine. When you believe that thought, how do you see yourself? What seems true about you, Tara, in that moment? It's not, so we focus in this moment because we're 10 zillion things a day, right? But with yeah. the work, we go into the shadow or into the yeah. you know, dark moment. How did you see yourself in that moment? Um, undisciplined, disorganized, um, weak. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, I even started to create stories of like, uh, wow, am I just like overstressed right now? I just need way more sleep. Like, am I, um, I started to treat myself like, what was the question? How did I treat myself? How did you, how did you see yourself? See myself. Um, 835 and you're just waking up. Yeah. I just, I saw myself as, um, well, like, what's the word? Just like, that's not going to cut it. Like uh, maybe uh, giving up on inadequate. my goal. Inadequate? Inadequate. Yeah. Inadequate. It's a great word. Um, and irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. How did I see myself? And I invite those listening. How do you see yourself when you believe the thought you should be more disciplined and you're not? Um, also like full of shit, <laughs> like, well, okay, <laughs> didn't do it again. <laughs> didn't. <laughs> when I go there, when I go there, sometimes, I mean, the thought comes up, loser. Right. Loser. Yeah. Totally. Yep. It's Big like, loser. uh-huh. Yeah. 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 And so this is an interesting sub question too, that I think is really important. So when we, the way we see something informs how we show up and how we behave around it, right? So my perception informs my behavior. We wonder why we do things. It's because of what you believe you're seeing. So when you see your own self as disorganized and undisciplined and weak and inadequate, full of shit, a loser, irresponsible, how are you actually treating yourself in that moment? I mean. 
yeah. um, quite abusive and belittling and um, lots, no compassion without compassion, um, uh, demanding, um, cruel, um, yeah, condemning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 How am I treating myself? Yeah. And, and somehow, you know, being cruel and demanding is supposed to inspire us to do better. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You see a little false logic there maybe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you believe this thought, um, does that feel like enough or should we go take a look at discipline? What do you believe is true about discipline? Yeah, great. I love these. So this is, these are the nuances that I just oh, I love so much. Um, so discipline, when I believe this thought, discipline is the ticket to success. It is um, what organized people have. It's what winners have. It's, um, it's, let's see, what else? What do I believe about discipline? It's highly desirable. Um, because it what? Because it what? Um, Why? Why is it highly desirable? What's true about it that makes it so desirable to have, to be totally disciplined? I think that what what I perceive as true about it is that, that it actually relieves it relieves stress, <laughs> which is pretty funny, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, doing a good job of that in the story, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, and that it's um, it will allow my life to become better when I have more of it. Yeah, I hear it's proof I'm good enough. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. proof that I'm I'm changing and evolving and growing and <laughs> doing the things that other people aren't willing to do, so I can get the results other people don't get, like all that kind of mindset. <laughs> makes me superior. Yeah, superior. Yeah, right. Like a a winner. Right. Win, right? Uh huh. Yep. Mm, okay. Yeah. So how do you? You know, so when you see discipline as the ticket to success, it's highly desirable. You know, it's what winners have makes you superior. How do you treat discipline? Um, I, I, I treat it as something that outranks other aspects of my life. Um, I kind of, I put it on a pedestal and, um, kind of romanticize it, I think. Yeah, romanticize it. What else? I prioritize it. Um, and I use it as a measuring stick of, I guess, I'd say, I don't know if my own worth, but I use it as a measuring stick of definitely how, how successful I am. <laughs> yeah. And when you said worth, I mean, I'll bet 90% of the people listening to this, our discipline, we have been taught that our discipline is a measure of our worth. And there yeah. will be a lot of people, you know, in the health and fitness industry that say, hell yeah, hell yeah. Right. Or entrepreneurship, like for sure. Yeah. yeah. Discipline is the key. Right. Right. Okay. So when you believe this thought that morning when you slept in until 8.30, you should be more disciplined in your evening routine. Well, that's probably enough for right now, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. So, yeah. So, you know, in a longer session, we ask a lot of, I ask a lot of questions just because it, it helps you to see the impact of our thoughts all right. across the board. And that's really clarifying. That's why I call my business Clarity Coaching. <laughs> yeah, and I think you can see, like you guys could probably sense in me that little bit of resistance 
of, um, I use, I, I find, I catch myself all the time saying uh, kind of this, or maybe a little, maybe it means I'm a little bit like that. Like I want to diminish it instead of just saying, so aware. Yes. <laughs> it means I'm not worthy. <laughs> like I want to be like, well, I mean, it, it could kind of sort of mean that, you know, <laughs> so like you can feel that resistance. And I think that's why we don't get to that level of processing is because there's certain things we don't want to admit. We don't, and we don't, you're exactly right. I love that you use the word focus because our mind does go all over the place and we get off track. You know, there's many times in sessions where I have to say like, wait, what was the question again? Like, what are we working on right now? We're working on what does that mean about me? What does that mean about the thing? You know? And one thing that's really cool that you do too is, um, there's like side people and characters that will kind of come into the situation and you'll pull those in like, well, what does that mean about money? Or what does that mean about that guy you're dating or what? You know? And it's like, oh my gosh, I have so many stories wrapped up into this one central thought. And that's why I can't get enough. That's why I always keep coming to you because there's, there's no end to that. There's no end to the stories that we're making up about certain things that are infiltrating all these areas of our lives and causing mm -hmm. us to show up small. That's, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. I did think of one more question I want to ask you. Really okay. fast. How did you see sleep. How did you see sleep? Oh, you see, there we go. <laughs> um, Oh, good question. Yeah. Sleep with sleep is not as important as discipline, which is ridiculous to hear myself say as a health coach. I'm like, what am I saying? But that is the story that I'm in. Sleep is that, that's the beauty is these questions bring <laughs> out the irrationality of the reactive, fearful mind. This right. is our fearful mind that's running the show, you know, mm -hmm. most of the time. So not as important as discipline because it's what? Waste of time. Yeah. It's a, it's a luxury. It's like, ah, oh, sleep later, <laughs> not during the work week, you know? So yeah, it's, it's crazy when you pinpoint it like that, because what, what I did emotionally was that's okay. Like, it's all good. I guess I just needed sleep last night, but there's all these underlying murky waters of all this stuff that isn't getting addressed. So the next yeah. time that happens, I go into the same, like, oh crap, are you freaking serious? Like, dang it, dude, you got to get your nighttime routine on point and none of it's getting addressed. It's just happening over and over and over like Groundhog Day. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So do I get that sleep is a waste of time or is there a better terror way to say it? Yeah. Sleep is, um, sleep is not as, I, I'd say it's not as important. Sleep is not as important as all the other things that I have going on. So it's like an indulgence maybe. Yeah. And it's like, uh, easy. It's something that can be, it's like, questionable. How much do I really need? Like, it's, it's okay. Like I don't have to get eight hours of sleep every night. I could get six sometimes, you know? So it's, um, this, like, it's kind of like the neglected, it's like the neglected child. It's kind of like, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> so it's, um, it's kind of ignored. It's unappreciated, right? All of those things. Not valued, not valued. Yeah. Mm hmm. Which is so interesting, you know, like, I, gosh, I, I mean, I have seen the impacts of sleep, but it's, it's interesting how in this story that I'm stuck in, it's getting diminished completely. Yeah. And, and you would never do this consciously. You wouldn't put nope. these thoughts in your day planner. I like to say, but right. this happens when you believe a stressful thought, because I like to the analogy I use for stressful thoughts is they're like kinking a garden hose. Mm -hmm. The hose works great. Everything's green as long as it's open and unknotted. But the minute you believe a stressful thought, it's like kinking the garden hose. And suddenly, you know, one side goes wonky and the other side goes dry. And it's the same thing in our lives with our stressful thoughts, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think, um, so, yeah, we would never do this stuff on purpose. <laughs> totally. I think um, one thing that's really helped me with that water hose analogy is when I do issues that came up in childhood. So like relationships with parents or siblings or something that happened in childhood, because I, I see how that water hose is spraying all over all my other relationships because I haven't rewritten the stories that I formed when I was five, six, seven years old. Right. So um, I'm sure you see that over and over. You've been doing this for 
Yes, yes. And so, yeah, and, and in my own life. I mean, there's still, and we actually look forward to issues because our challenges are actually portals to higher ground, I like to say. So it's not about never having an issue again, but it's right. the more you do the work, the less of an issue the issues are because you know there's, there's goodness in this somewhere and you can find your way to it. Does that make yeah. sense? Yep. Could you could you speak a little bit on the realms of power? I think this yeah. is so, especially right now with like all the tension from 2020, I think this is really helpful information. Okay, so this is a take on Byron Katie's three kinds of business. Because it's so important, something inside of me asked for a different way to say it. She calls it the three kinds of business. I call it the three realms of power because it's such a game changer in my experience. Yep. So. This is, a, this is an offshoot of Katie's three realms of, or three kinds of business. So there's my realm of power, there's your realm of power, and then there's God or the universe's or higher power's realm of power, whatever, the God of your understanding, whatever that might be. And occasionally people are like, I don't do the God thing, Catherine. And I'm like, okay, then there's two realms of power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so who cares? Why do we care about realms of power? because of this well let me tell you what the realm so my realm of power is how i see myself katherine dixon mm -hmm. how i see my world and everything in it and everyone in it and how i operate ag accordingly again my perception informs my behavior so what i think i see informs how i show up so how i see you tara is completely my creation yeah yeah. So everybody else has their version of my realm of power, which is your realm of power, right? So your, you know, realm of power is how you see yourself, how you see your world, how you see me. I don't get to vote how you see me. And right. how you see me is all about you, not me. Yeah. You know? So, and then God's realm of power or the universe's realm of power, I give for the purpose of this, you know, clarifying context. Um, Things like the rotation of the planets. I like to say they don't run into each other very often. Yay, God. Right? <laughs> and, and the beating of our hearts and photosynthesis, things that, you know, really make life rock on this world that we clearly don't get to vote about. So why do we care about whose realm of power is whose? Because the only time that we can suffer, the only time that we feel pain, like not pain, but suffering is when we are focused outside of our realm of power. Now we can't really leave our realm of power. I like to think of my realm of power as a little, um, uh, like a sparkly dome of light, <laughs> you know, and you're in it your whole life. You are never going to get out of your perceptual reality. And I don't know about never, but it's not all that likely that you will um, because you are the creator of your experience. But the minute you're concerned about what someone else is doing or thinking about you or not doing, mm -hmm. you go brain dead in your realm of power because I don't get to vote how they show up. I don't get to vote what they think about me in case you haven't noticed, right? You know, we can plead, we can beg, we can argue, we can threaten, we can do whatever, and they're still going to do whatever they're going to do. It's called free agency. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? That's what informs the joy and the power in my own life. 100%. Hundred percent. I just asked on Facebook this morning because I was doing a podcast, my other podcast with El Russ, um, Kick Ass Life. We were talking about um, adult bullying, and one of the one of the concepts we got in, into was talking about you know on social media. You know, I've I've been so curious, like what is it that sparks us as human beings to want to? We see an opinion that someone else has and we want to attack. We want to be heard. We want to make sure that they see our point of view. And a lot of times it's like, and we want to shut them down and we want to make them feel bad and shame them for having that point of view. And then the person who posts it comes back at the other person and they're like, no, shame on you for having your point of view. And that goes back and forth in this like big, big fight, you know, and we see this all the time. And I'm fascinated by that. And I think, you know, I asked on Facebook this morning, I'm like, why, why do you guys think people, why do you think we do that? Like, what's at the core of that? And I found one of the question, one of the answers interesting. And this guy said, well, I do that sometimes. And I think the reason I do it is because I think if, 
you know, for every thousand times I do this, I'm able to help one person uh, be happier <laughs> or see things in a new way, then it would be worth it. And I immediately thought of this realms of power <laughs> talk and I thought, ah, oh, interesting. So, so it's, I think there's this belief when you're outside of your realm of power, you think I can like actually persuade people to change and think like I can because I'm so right. And that's when this all starts to become wonky and miserable. And now you're stressed out and you're telling your friends about it and <laughs> all of that. So I think the realm of power thing, you know, as social media increases, I'll let you speak on that. But, you know, I think that it's really important for us to understand this because we can really release ourselves yes. from all this stuff, mental, emotional suffering that happens because we want to control their realm of power and their point of view. Right. And we can't, and you know, we can't leave our realm of power and no one really influences us. Now, a lot of people are going to say, what? But <laughs> you influence yourself. Even Byron Katie, who I adore, she hit something inside of me that just resonated like yeah. nobody's business. Right. And I influence myself. So when I get angry at someone, I, it's not them that did it to me. It's me. I am believing my angry thoughts about them. They don't have the power to anger me. That's right. Only I can do that, you know? And so when you get that, you really become aware of how free you really are. Yeah, this is something... Yeah. <laughs> this is something I talk to my kids about all the time, right? Because I have a 14 year old daughter and then I have three boys under her and they drive her crazy, right? She, they drive her crazy, which is, a, you know, she's 14. We'll give her a break, but it is a little bit of a, <laughs> it is a choice. I'm all, I'm always telling her, you know, Hey, Ken's like, they, they're just doing that. It's your choice if you want to get frustrated by it or not. <laughs> and then one day we're driving along and I was like, yelling at them <laughs> in the car. They were being so loud and so rambunctious and crying and like pulling each other's arms. And I was like, holy cow, you guys, like you got to stop. I'm like getting all mad. And she's like, mom, it's your choice to get angry right now. <laughs> and she totally called me on it, but I appreciated it. Cause I was like, yeah. you're right. It is. It is totally yeah. reflection. Yeah. It's totally a reflection of me. I, I am frustrated, stressed, and I, they, I'm allowing that to be an excuse for me to now get pissed. <laughs> and when we think we have to control them, we become, we feel powerless. Yeah. You know? And this isn't about not asking for what you want, because this isn't about complacency. Mm. You are encouraged, inspired to ask for what you want 10,000 times. If, mm. if you really want something, just don't make your well being contingent on compliance from someone outside of you. Mm, you wow. ask for what you want, you know, you will get it one way or another. Wow. But don't try, don't be so sure you know where it's going to come from. Wow. Okay. I, I was wondering, I don't know how much, I, I know. We, we need to get to the other side of your piece too. Oh, do we? <laughs> yeah, don't we? <laughs> all right. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I, wanna, I mean, are we just an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's we keep get going. Okay. So right. when you believe this thought, I'm going to read it back to you, Tara. Yes. This is what I call the harvest. This is the thoughts that we harbor when we believe this thought, our stressful thought. In this particular moment, the thought is I should be, you should be more disciplined in your evening routine. When you believe that thought that morning, you shamed yourself. You were disappointed, frustrated, frazzled. You have to rewrite your whole day. You would, felt like a disappointment as a coach and you beat yourself up deep inside you thought dang it dude and then you were trying to be nice to you but you were not in your body at first there was this wave of weakness you felt it in your face and your neck and your chest embarrassment instantly then adrenaline go let's go very rushed adrenaline frantic to salvage as much of the morning as you can you felt it in your limbs you saw yourself in that moment with the belief that you should be more disciplined in your evening routine as undisciplined, disorganized, weak. You even started to create stories. You, are you overstressed? Do you need more sleep? You saw yourself as inadequate, irresponsible, full of shit, and a loser. And in that, you were quite abusive to yourself, Tara. You belittled yourself. You had no compassion for you. You were demanding, cruel, and condemning. You see discipline as the ticket to success. It's what organized people and winners have. It's highly desirable and it relieves stress <laughs> and it will allow your life to become better when you have more of it. It's proof that you're good enough, that you're changing, that you're evolving, that you're growing. Discipline makes you superior. 
and it makes you a winner. So you treat it as something that outranks everything else. You put it on a pedestal, you romanticize discipline, you prioritize it, and you use it as a measuring stick for how successful you are and how much worth you have. And sleep, well, that's not as important as discipline. Sleep's a luxury. It's questionable, actually. How much do you really need, after all? It's the neglected child. Ignored, unappreciated, not valued. Bam. Can you see a reason to drop this thought that you should be more disciplined in your evening routine, Tara? Yes. Yeah. Can you see any reason? This is an interesting sub-question. Can you see any reason to keep this thought that feels good <clears throat> in that moment, that morning? Yeah. Is there any reason to keep that thought that actually feels good or brings you peace? No, not that feels good or brings peace. So let's go back to waking up at 8.30. Exactly everything's the same, mm -hmm. but it doesn't even occur to you that you should be more disciplined in your evening routine. Mm -hmm. What do you notice without that thought? <laughs> My immediate thought was, oh man, that felt good. I got lots of sleep last night. <laughs> that if it didn't occur to me that there was anything wrong with that at all, like that was totally fine, which it technically was, that I didn't miss anything. Like the day was fine, right? So without that thought, I would have been like, oh, like, wow, I feel good. Ah, like I could have, um, what's the word, savored the moment <laughs> of refreshment and, and, and extra sleep. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up with you. Refreshment and extra sleep. Yeah. How does your body feel without the story that you should have been more, you should be more disciplined in your evening routine? How does your body feel? No concept. Like this is just imagining who we are without the stressful thought. And sometimes people are like, well, I'm just making this up, Catherine. And I'm like, well, you made the other stuff up too, just yeah. for the record. Right, yeah. Where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I think without that thought at all, my body would have felt calm and relaxed and refreshed. Okay. Yeah. 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 How do you see yourself without that thought? Hmm. <laughs> My immediate thought was, oh, I'm so, I'm so grateful that I like pushed through an entrepreneurship so I can make my own hours and like have this kind of flexibility. Right. So I think I would have seen myself without that thought. Like I would have seen myself as like, pretty awesome for creating a life in which I can do that sometimes. <laughs> Feel that. So, you know, when you get your answers, let yourself savor them. That's a good word, you know. Mm -hmm. What else is true about you without the thought that you should have more discipline in your evening routine? Hmm. I think, um, that I'm always just always free to choose. It's just always a choice. And, and, um, there's no like shoulds, right. I should every night be asleep by nine. Like it's like more, I, f I think I feel the freedom of life more without that thought. Okay. Yeah. Way more freeing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it feels a little more free. <laughs> yeah. 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 What else is true about you? Are you undisciplined and disorganized and weak? <laughs> I think it's a more that I'm a human and things come up sometimes. Um, and that I let's see. It's just, I feel more accountable to my choices, honestly, like instead of shaming myself about them, it's just like, okay, well, yeah, that's what I chose last night. Um, so more, yeah, more free to choose, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and did you have a good time the night before? I did. Yeah, it was a positive experience. 
Yeah, that's a nice thing to notice. Right. You know, which you wouldn't have had if you'd gone to sleep at a disciplined time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So more free to choose. Without this thought, are you irresponsible? No. Are you weak? Nope. No. No, that wouldn't have even crossed my mind. Yeah. What's the truth about you if you're not those things? And don't be shy. I know this is a podcast, but go for it. <laughs> I'm doing my best to be vulnerable for you guys. If you're still listening. I'm like, I'm trying to go right in like I would in a session. Um, what would be true about me if I never had the thoughts? Yeah, I, should be- I mean, I asked, I was just contrasting it a little bit because you said you were weak and inadequate. Yeah. Um, I think, it, you know, without the ever having the thought, that thought, it would be more true about me that I'm um, fun and flexible and prioritize life and relationships over, over uh, what would you call it? Like arbitrary rules. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Are you a loser? Uh, nope. <laughs> 830? Nope. No. I mean, that's <laughs> ridiculous, right? Yeah. Are you, are you full of shit? Nope. <laughs> no, none of that stuff. Right. And I just love how without the thought, what you just seem, what just seems so true is clearly irrelevant. Right. Because it is the thought of the, these are the old stuff, what we just, the harvest we just went through is the reactive mind on steroids. It is right. not going to get you where you want to go. Right. Yep. Fine, but it doesn't have the capacity. Your heart, which this work gives voice to, does. Mm-hmm. So how would you have treated yourself without that thought? <laughs> yeah, without even having the thought at all. I mean, I think I would have just... I treated myself. Um, How would you have been with you? It's 8.31. You planned on getting up at five or whatever. I just think it would have been uh, a more of a, like a grateful reevaluation of the day, like more of a, okay, that's, let's, what do we do now? versus like beating myself up about the past. So I think I would have just been a little more, if I, if I hadn't been like, Oh, it's cause your evening routine was messed up. And I just woke up at that time. It would have just been like, okay, here's the present situation. Where do I go from here? Instead of beating myself up over what happened in the past. And does it seem like a bad and wrong situation? Nope. Exactly. Yeah. It removes that bad and wrong mentality for sure. Right, right. So no cruelty or condemnation. Right. More compassion. Yes. How do you see discipline without the thought that you should have more of it in your nightly routine? Hmm. It's interesting as I go through this process, like what happens in my mind is um, this like hard nosed, like discipline, like have to turns into more of a like want to free choice, but it's not like a set in stone thing. So I'd I'd say (laughs) discipline kind of turns into what sleep was, is more of like an an option um, depending on how I'm prioritizing my day that day. Right. So it's like, yeah, it doesn't work tonight, but that's okay. You know, versus like, it's a freaking Wednesday. You have to have discipline on Wednesday. So I think discipline becomes, uh, more, more of a choice Mm -hmm. than a have to. Okay. I'd say, I'd say I'd also see it as less of a control mechanism, right? Like it, it, it's more of like, it's coming from within me, not with outside of me. Wow. Wow. Now feel that. Yeah. 
comes from within instead of outside of me. Right. Does it make you superior? <laughs> no. Not that boring. Nope. <laughs> Does it make you superior? No. It's no. just just a choice. That's all. Yeah. Um, is it a measure of your worth, your discipline? No, not at all. Not without that thought. How's that feel? Um, feel I feel more, it feels more mature, honestly. It feels more aligned with who I am. It feels more, um, I guess, in my realm of power. <laughs> like it feels more like, like I am the, uh, the creator here versus like I'm the student that has to do whatever I'm supposed to do, kind of ex extrinsic rule environment. So it feels more empowering, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Nice. Um, okay. And how about sleep? How does sleep look without this thought that you should have more discipline in your night routine? given that you just had three and a half hours more of it than you planned on. Yeah. Um, I should have more discipline without that thought. We have two minutes. Sleep looks like something that can, um, yeah, it looks more valuable, I guess. And it looks like something that my body was asking for and I gave it to it with love instead of begrudgingly with regret. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sleep. Is it less important than discipline? Nope. Equal? Mm, without the thought, any more goods? discipline in my evening routine. It looks more flexible without that thought. Yeah. It looks more, more flexible. Like I can roll with the punches a little bit more instead of like, dang it. I had to get to sleep at nine. <laughs> so yeah. We still there? Yep. Sorry. It cut out for just a second. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So in honor of time, I want to read this back, but I can't, right? Yeah, you can. You can. It won't cut off or anything. Yeah. Okay. So without the belief that you should be more disciplined in your evening routine, you would have woken and thought, oh man, that felt good. You've got a lot of sleep last night. You didn't miss anything. The day was actually fine. And oh, wow, you feel good. You could have savored the moment of refreshment and extra sleep. Your body feels calm, relaxed, refreshed without that story in your head. And you see yourself and you're so grateful you pushed through in your entrepreneurship and you make your own hours. It's pretty awesome that you've created a lifestyle that allows that freedom. You, you're always free to choose. That's who you are. And there's no shoulds. You feel the freedom of life more without that thought, which is way more freeing. And you're human and things come up sometimes. It's like, how do you know it should be 8.30? It is. <laughs> when you argue with that, you lose, right? You feel more accountable to your choices. And the night before was a positive experience. You're more free to choose. And you're more fun and flexible. And you prioritize life and relationships over arbitrary rules. You would have been more grateful. Uh, I'm sorry. You would have been it would have been more of a grateful reevaluation of the day. Okay, what do you do now? And here's the present situation. You would have more compassion for you. And discipline um, turns without this thought turns discipline from the hard nosed have to into a want to, a free choice, more of an option. Discipline is depending on how you prioritize your day more of a choice than a have to, less of a control mechanism. And it comes from within rather than outside of you. 
It's just a choice is all. It's not superior and it's not at all a measure of your worth. It feels more mature, honestly, and aligned with who you are. You're more conscious in your realm of power without this thought. You are the creator here and you are more empowered without this thought. Sleep is more valuable. Your body was asking for it, obviously, and you gave it with love. Um, it looks more flexible and you can roll with the punches. Yeah. yeah. So now with this inquiry, you get to choose life with the thought or life without it. Before inquiry, you're stuck with your thoughts, right? Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah. There's barely awareness. I'd say there's barely awareness that that's running the show over and over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and thank you for doing that. This was kind of impromptu. I hadn't planned on actually running yeah. through a scenario. So I hope that was valuable for anybody listening to give you kind of, a, that's a mini session. That's a very, very mini. We didn't dig deep. There would have been so much more, so many more feeling words and things that come, come up in those sessions. And I think what, what I'd like to point out is like this, what happens now, oftentimes, like I can't even hardly talk to people for the rest of the day after a session, or I might fall asleep really early that night. Kind of funny <laughs> with our topic here, but, and I think it's just because I'm, I'm allowing that the integration of these new thoughts to simmer in. And I think sometimes for me, I know there's, there's fear, there's fear associated with it. I want to keep those thoughts because I believe and perceive that having this disciplined thought is really serving me. It's really helping me, you know? And so letting it go, there's this little fear of like, well, does that mean I'm just like, I'm just going to start going to bed at 12 o'clock every night now, you know, (laughs) but it's never what happens. I always end up showing up in a place of more empowerment, more, uh, more freedom is really, truly how it feels more able to let go of these condemning, limiting thoughts that don't serve me. Right. And it always brings me more into this place of power. This work has been like my secret secret weapon. You know, I've gone through a lot of change in the last few years of my life and people are like, dang, Tara, like you changed so fast. I'm like, yeah, Catherine, I mean, <laughs> I'm open about plant medicines and, 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 and working with you, but I'm like, really, truly like the cream of the crop has been this work because this is where the actual practical change happens versus listening to a book or listening to a podcast or, you know, having the awareness at first, the initial awareness is great and really valuable. But until you get into the nitty gritty of what's going on in that mind of yours, it doesn't really change. You just yeah. live in the reaction. So thank the you. Word, for- the word gives you a visceral experience of the freedom that you are, I love which it. is way different than a theory. Yes. A yes. You know? That is you can't talk about your freedom. You just have to feel it. And that's what transforms you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for doing that um, and showing them a a glimpse of it. And so if people want to reach you, um, should they go to claritycoachinginstitute.com or what's the best way to get a hold of you? That's the best way. Yeah. Yeah. I don't spend a lot of time doing social media or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, I've got a little Instagram, but I'm very negligent around it because I'm so busy. (laughs) With this work. I mean, I love it. So just go to Clarity Coaching Institute and you can contact us and um, we'll get you on the calendar. I work with a number of coaches. And so, yeah. Yeah. And and from anywhere, guys, you know, it's Zoom calls mostly that you do it through. Primarily, yes, yes. Yeah. It's like anybody I recommend to Catherine, I'm like, I, here you go. This is the greatest gift I could ever give you. (laughs) Like, please do it. You know, I kind of harass my friends. I'm like, did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? Because it's just such a beautiful gift. It's life-changing really, truly like on such a deep, profound level. So thank you for serving Mm -hmm. and doing what you do and changing so many of our lives. Like I know have so many friends that have worked with you that it's, yeah, it's completely altered the trajectory of our lives because now we have gotten rid of these limiting mindsets that are causing us to suffer unnecessarily. So thank you. Yes. yes. One of Byron Katie's lines that I love so much is suffering is optional. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. That is definitely what you start to learn as you do the work more and more. So thank you so much. You guys go find Catherine at claritycoachinginstitute.com. And yeah, again, thank you so much for spending time with us today, Catherine. Thank you for having me. It was a delight, Tara, always.